From deep in the heart of Central Texas, it's the Best of the Outdoors podcast. Brought to you by Texas Fish and Game Magazine, the voice of the Texas Outdoor Nation. I am your humble host, Dustin Vaughn Warnke, the Outdoor Success Guy, back with another podcast for you having a lot of fun almost a video just now because i've been doing a lot of videos on my youtube channel um having a lot of fun with this man and happy new year to all of you guys this one's releasing right after the new year so if you're listening to it later then happy new year belated new year i guess i should say but wanted to also wish everybody a happy belated merry christmas uh before that I've not had a new show out in the last about three weeks. I'm about a week behind right now, but it's because we took a little bit of a break in the Texas Outdoor Nation world uh, for Christmas and New Year's and just kind of um, relaxing there a little bit with family, spending some time in the outdoors and that kind of stuff. So I hope you will forgive me that I've been out of whack for the last three weeks, and we normally do these shows every two weeks. So I just took a week-long break. I hope that's okay with all of you listeners out there. (laughs) Um, I really appreciate you guys watching, reading, and listening to all of our stuff here at Texas. Texas Vision Game. Uh, This show is a Texas-based show, but we are all over the world and all over the nation with content. And um, we we kind of, you know, first of all, name the website Texas Fishing Game, fishgame.com, the national news of Texas. But the more of it is just the the outdoor nation. I mean, the news of the outdoor nation is what we're calling it now. And um, you know, it's it's so much. Texas has such a diversified you know platform in it. But I mean, there's just so much outside of Texas that's happening and going on. And we try to give kind of some national coverage and some local coverage and things that people are going to find interesting about wildlife and that kind of stuff. Um, Chester Moore does a great job curating all of our website content and that kind of stuff. And I mean, it's just been a fantastic part of my life to work with that, um, that man and, and, uh, all the other writers here at Texas fishing game. So thank you guys again so much for watching, reading, listening, reading the magazine, uh, whatever the case may be, whatever you do, I really appreciate you all. And I want to thank especially the guys from the confluence writers event, who put on the uh, event that we had, Brad Downey and Dennis Bro, uh, especially from Frontier Sales and Marketing. They put on an event for us in November of 2018, uh, a couple of months ago now, and um, right before Thanksgiving week, and, and really, really did a good job of showcasing a bunch of their um, companies, that their manufacturer reps, so they, they basically bring a lot of companies together to us riders that we can write about, and uh, content that we can cover and that kind of stuff and just did a fantastic job so i want to give a big shout out to them i know they're listening so um and in this podcast this is going to be two kind of another fishing mashup like our podcast before last was uh it's going to be ryan jones talking about kayaks paddle sports sups um you know all the things that we do in the in the water personal watercraft family and then I've got Dave Brown from Okuma to talk a little bit about fishing, a little short segment that him and I did just to kind of fill out this episode. And you got about an hour of content here, and I think you're going to find this interesting. I think you're going to find this fun field and, um, you know, educational and all the things that I try to do with this podcast. Man, I don't do this show for me, guys. I do this show for you. And I want you guys to know that, I mean, I I really walk around thinking about this stuff all the time, what I'm going to do next on the podcast. Chester and I have already planned out an editorial calendar for this year, for 2019. And, um, you know, I just, the more I do this, I'd love to hear back from you guys. I love all of you guys for finding me on Facebook W A R N C K E Dustin, my first name. Um, just, just finding me on Facebook and telling me you like the show and you listen, man. That means the world to me. That is my oxygen. Your comments and your feedback is my oxygen on this show. So, really appreciate you guys. Before we get started with all this fun stuff today, I want to mention the sponsor of this particular podcast, which is AccuSharp. AccuSharp had sponsored in November and December, but since I didn't have a third show in December. I'm doing them for the first podcast of January because um, it's their turn. So (laughs) one more and then we we resume back with them in uh, March and April and we'll do some more podcast uh, sponsorship spots with them. But uh, when was the last time you sharpened your knives, man? Sharpening your blade with an AccuSharp is actually very easy. The AccuSharp is a double beveled knife sharpener pre-angled to your blade. All you need to do is run your AccuSharp through your blade to get it back to sharp that's it 
These can be found at Academy Sports and Outdoor stores or your local hardware store in most cases, or check them out at AccuSharp.com to find a list of stores in your area that carries AccuSharp, or you can purchase one online at many fine online retailers. Check out AccuSharp. Man, I tell the story a lot on this podcast, and if this is your first time hearing it, that's great. If it's not, that's fine, but still have the original AccuSharp uh, blue and white knife sharpener my dad gave me for Christmas many years ago, and it still works man it's still it's a little beat up it's a little bit um it's a little bit scratched and stuff because i've used it so much but man the thing is just tough as nails and it's just it lasts for a while and um it lasts for years and it also uh keeps keeps your edge in the field man keeps your um keeps your stuff going on going strong and uh and performing well for you in the outdoors i've got to say man one of the things that i uh and i know this is a fishing show please please forgive me when i'm skinning hogs man there's nothing that will dull a knife quicker than skinning a hog uh, or getting through the bones of a big redfish or anything like that. Um, AccuSharp helps you keep your edge, helps you, um, helps you, you know, keep the performance of your knife up to speed. And I was just recently, uh, skinning a deer at, um, uh, when I was recording some, some segments and just running that AccuSharp through that sharpener, you know, through the knife real quick, uh, just putting that edge, kind of finishing that edge on it again real quick, uh, really made all the difference in, in that skinning job. So, um, really for, for kind of, you know, keeping your edge in the field and doing what you do best out there, uh, check out AccuSharp Knife Sharpeners. That's AccuSharp.com, AccuSharp.com for AccuSharp Knife Sharpeners. Thank you guys so much for sponsoring the show. And here is our first interview with Mr. Ryan Jones from Frontier Sales and Marketing, talking about paddle sports, kayaks, personal watercraft, all kinds of stuff like that. Here we go. So joining me on the podcast, I have Ryan, and tell us your full name, Ryan. Ryan Jones. Ryan Jones. Well, that's easy to remember. <laughs> <laughs> nice and simple. E- easy to spell. It's spelled the regular way Ryan is spelled, right? Yes, it is. R Y A N. Just wondering. So, um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. You're with Frontier Sales and Marketing. You put on this event that we're at. Um, and basically, you're their kayak guy, right? Yep. Yeah, I am the kayak guru, kayaks, paddleboards, uh, fishing. I've spent uh, quite a few years on the retail side of the paddle sports business, um, which I landed just from personal desire and passion sure. being out and enjoying the sport uh, back before they had the product that made it as enjoyable as it is today. Mm-hmm. And I've just fallen in love with it. Um, I, I grew up in the middle of Oklahoma City, and my mom always tells people I spent more time living in our backyard than I ever did the house. <laughs> so it was just kind of natural for me to kind of fall in this place, just to have a love and a passion for the outdoors and the peace and the tranquility it brings. So being able to do it and coming from a you know a blue-collar family, didn't have a lot of income, uh, spent most of my time shore fishing growing up as a kid. Right. And... Uh, got put into Boy Scouts and that's kind of actually what got me started. We, I grew up in uh, canoes all the time fishing mm-hmm. and then turned into kayaks and now it's kayaks and paddle boards. And yeah. So uh, basically been doing this most of my life. Uh, that's cool. How old a man are you? I'm 36. Oh cool. You know, we're not that far away then. I'm 39. So nice. yeah, that's cool. I didn't realize that. Um, you know, the one of the things I talked about before we started recording was that kayaks, paddle boards, sups, whatever you want to call them, personal watercraft like this, and then even the micro skiffs are basically making the outdoors more affordable and making the water more accessible to people. And the other benefit that I see is that you're able to get back in tighter areas that you can't get with the big boat. Correct. Um, it definitely takes us to a new place. A lot of times people think of uh, fishing, um, you think of a bass boat. You know, and when I was younger, they were a lot more affordable. Nowadays, these boats and the motors alone cost more than a than a pickup truck. Yeah, or a car or anything. And yeah, so exactly. being able to get through and uh, have an efficient kayak that is appealing to the fishermen, that there's a market. I mean, you can get a kayak anywhere from $200 to six, 7000 And there's, there's models all the way through that range. So no matter what your budget is, you're able to get out there on the water in some capacity and get further than your shore fishermen or your tube fishermen. Um, And nowadays with all the accessories and options and even the motors they have on them, now you have a craft that goes everywhere a boat can go and everywhere a boat can't go. Right. 
So uh, it really opens the doors, um, especially since Google Earth came yeah, <laughs> came out. Sure. Um, you're able to pull your phone out and see these bodies of water you never knew were there mm -hmm. and go and explore them. And a, and a kayak, in my opinion, is one of the most efficient, effective, and uh, affordable ways to do that. It's funny. One of the places I, I shore fish a lot is Divine Lake Park, which is a little bitty hole-in-the-wall park that has a small lake on it in Leander, where I live. And... The funny thing about it is it's such a windy lake, you know, it's flat, and so there's a lot of wind that just goes through there or whatever. I see the kayakers get on there, and they're all gung-ho, whatever, that wind just beats them up, and they're like, oh, screw this, and they get off of the water. But there are things in the in the industry now that you've shown us this weekend, or this, this whole week, that, you know, ha can help, you know, fight the wind, fight the drag, fight, you know, all the elements and stuff, such as, like, the micro skiff, or I, I guess I call it the micro skiff, am I saying that right, like the rover, like the yep. the, the boat rover? Yeah, okay. it's kind of a new, brand new category right. that isn't completely defined yet, um, and, uh, and it's a completely new place that uh, a lot of this paddle craft are kind of go to for states that have larger bodies of water. Mm -hmm. um, coming from spending the last three years in Florida, I would have thought nothing about a little micro one-person skiff before then, but you get down there, um, if you're somebody who just loves spending all the time on the water, every time you get out, you're like, man, I wish I could have covered that much more sure, ground. Sure, sure. And uh, just allows you to have more accessories, um, the ability to cover more ground, and these little guys are able to put a little bit of little outboard motor on there you can put a little trolling motor on there right you know the the ability to take a trolling motor and now put a lithium battery on it which will last a lot longer right last longer the biggest thing is the weight so going from a, a deep cycle battery that weighs 50 60 70 mm -hmm. 80 pounds you're going to a battery that has the same capacity but weighs a quarter the weight. I have to say, yeah, I've seen I mean, them at the iCast shows. You, yeah. I mean, you pay the price for them, but right. they're they're a lot easier to maintenance. And the weight, you know, it, you know, you can have that weight in a lot of these kayaks sure. because they have four, five, six hundred pound capacities. Yeah. But then it throws your balance off, and you know, you're not set right in a kayak, and your bow is either super heavy or the back end's really heavy, and you sure. know, you kind of a balancing game. So. But with these little skiffs, the paddle boards, the kayaks, um, you've got trolling motor or you've got trolling motor companies like Minn Kota that people put on there and they rig themselves. Uh, there's some guys in Texas that build mounts for kayaks specifically oh, cool. for working with Minn Kota. Um, then you have larger companies uh, such as Torquedo. It's a German company. Mm -hmm. They uh, they're really the first to come out with a kayak small paddle craft motor. They've been around for quite a few years. Yeah, uh, you pay probably. quite a pretty penny for them, but they're extremely efficient. They've been around for a long time. They've got the technology. Um, and as of a little over a year ago, now you've got a company out of California called Bigsby. Mm -hmm. And they have a little jet, little bitty super lightweight jet propulsion, and they've got a motor you can actually take and change the mounts to go on a paddleboard, to go on a kayak, or to uh, use handheld and actually go diving or swimming or oh, something like that. Hold on, when you're saying jet in, like jet in, you're talking about it's going to shoot a rooster tail. Kind it's of little bitty jet? jet propulsion. This thing weighs less than ten pounds. Um, it's just got a little cone right there. The blade on it, literally the circumference is, Real small. I mean, just a few inches yeah. and it will propel a kayak and get you going. You know, you're not going fast, but you're doing two, three, four, f up to five miles an hour, which in a small paddle craft is faster than paddling. <laughs> but will it leave a rooster tail behind no, you? No, oh, no, darn. No, 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 I'm no, just, no. You just say <laughs> Jeff Repulster and I'm just like, let's do this, baby. <laughs> Because I, and the reason I bring that up, I bow fish a lot. I, I, I bow fish as much as I can. Um, my bow fishing guy, Marty McIntyre, I bring him up for a couple of reasons. He's great. Garquest.com is his website. He um, he owned a jet boat, like a like a, a standard. I think it was a twenty four footer. You know, uh, you know, conventional boat, and it had a bow fishing deck and everything on it. The thing had a jet engine on it, or like you know, a jet propulsion on it, yep. an impeller and all that stuff. And so he literally spit a rooster tail out the back of the boat. And I was just thinking, well, that would be really cool in a kayak. But um, the other thing is that he is really big about rivers and lakes and kayaks and canoes. And he had, you know, one of the com a kayak companies out there, New Canoe, in you Canoe. Um, they basically he would rig a trolling motor on the back of one of those, and and you know, trolling motor on all kinds of different crafts that he could get, uh, you know, just to hit the river 
rivers and the lakes to go bow fishing. Yep. And he liked to stand and shoot, which is common. Um, so, I mean, and I want to mention one of our listeners, Orlando. I know he listens a lot. Big shout out to you. Um, he, uh, you know, he's he's one of the people that inspires me to keep on going with kayaking because it makes it's better for guys. You know, it, it's better for everybody because it's accessibility to everybody, which I've always been about on this podcast. But I mean, that all being said, it's about approaching the water in a new way. And as you said perfectly last night during your presentation, an intimate way to approach fishing. It really is, you know. Uh, the few times I've spent my life being on a boat, the the only way I know how to describe it is, like I said last night, it's the the conqueror versus the conquered. Yes, that's a good. Way to say um, it. Even when you're fishing offshore for pelagics and stuff, you know, you get a big fish on, uh, the boat goes in reverse and starts chasing it yep, down. Yep. And in a in a kayak, it, it really evens the playing ground out. Sure. There's there's a different perspective and a different thought process. How you fight, um, keeping your rod bent, all those things. There's so many different factors in there. You really have to encounter and, and figure out that it just really makes it very dynamic way. And it's a great experience. And you're out there. There's there are so many things. I see being in a kayak looking around whether it's sea turtles out in the middle of the ocean mm-hmm. I've had selfish jump 10 foot away from oh me. my goodness um, one of the most amazing experiences I saw him out in a kayak 300 foot deep offshore off of Dania Beach in Florida and I look over and there is a single shrimp and he, he is being chased by a black fin tuna. <laughs> and literally run for his for run, like run. 20 minutes, I watched this epic battle out yes. in the middle of nowhere in my kayak, and the shrimp won. The shrimp won. The shrimp no. won. The little guy wins. I love it, man. <laughs> Oh my God! But you know, you go through like we we're talking about hunting. I, you know, I take yep. my crossbow out on my paddleboard, and I've done bow fishing, and you know, using paddlecraft to get out to hunt and to fish, especially when you're out on public land and yep. stuff like that, yep. comes in really handy because you're you have access to get places most of your other hunters are going to be. For one, it's safer. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these animals know those places very well. We just don't know that. But then also, the paddle craft just doesn't scare them. Um, I had a time um, right dab in the middle of Oklahoma City. We had the Canadian River. And I uh, was just out there for a nice paddle one day. Had a big, long 14-foot kayak. My dog's behind me. We're paddling. I see a doe on the shore. And I'm like, start paddling over. My dog sees the doe. Um, she's not one to chase it. She just sat there and watched it. We paddled right up. I banged that kayak. Sat there for five minutes talking to the doe. She never got up. Wow. Well, that's a story now. Yeah. And then How I'm, cool. you know, I was able to back up and just keep on. She never moved. It just yeah. like, it, they, it just doesn't scare them away. I mean, eagles, I've gotten right under some beautiful bald eagles and osprey and, uh, you know, and then talking about fish, I mean, you can sneak up on some fish. I had one time I fished this little pond and it had just flooded and uh, a lot of the water was up in the grass. And I saw these two good sized catfish, 15, 20 pounds a piece together. And I have a, one of my um, units I use is a catamaran style paddleboard. Mm-hmm. And I actually got both the pontoons of the catamaran on top of the fish wow. before they knew I was there. And then I have these two fish, they don't know how to go backwards, they can't go forwards, and they're just rocking, hitting the bottom of my kayak. <laughs> and I just got a huge laugh out of it. It was fun. You know, so the the perspective and you know, you you kind of feel like you're a lot more equal and, and one on one with nature in yeah. general. Um, which I just have a great appreciation for. Yeah, and not to get too deep, but I mean, that's kind of the, the whole primal nature of why a lot of times we hunt and fish. It's just to get out there and enjoy God's creation and enjoy that communion with nature. And I think a kayak allows you to do that a lot more intimately than than, than a lot of other things. The thing, like I started out with kayaks, let's see, 15 years ago, and I, I'd rent some from Town Lake, which is down in Austin where I used to live. And um, my back would hurt so bad, you know, or my knees would hurt so bad getting in and out of it. And the innovations that have happened, especially with the bonafide kayaks that you, you represented here, 
um, have just changed all that. Absolutely. Uh, Seat comfort, like I was talking to you guys last night, you know, for me going out on a kayak trip, what makes or breaks a trip for me are seat comfort and paddle. Mm -hmm. You know, your paddle is your motor. Right. Um, you want a high performance motor to be more efficient the whole time you're out there. Yes. But even more so to when it comes to introducing the sport to a, a larger audience and also your veterans, um, your retired groups. Yes. You know, we have a very large population over the age of 55. And a lot of them have knee issues. A mm -hmm. lot of them have back, back issues, issues sure. you know, slip disc, all kinds of yeah. stuff. But they still want to get out on the water. And, you know, you take a bass boat or something out, that jars you. I mean, you really get out there going, and you hit some choppy water. That's a good point. I never really thought of it like that, but you're right. You hit some choppy water, and it is a rough ride. Yeah, I mean, and you just, you know, it's not really comfortable. I've had a few bass boat trips I come back from, and I'm sore from it. You know, and when I first got into kayaks, you know, the kayaks I used, I was not comfortable in whatsoever. I actually had a one of my first ones I started using was a two person sit inside kayak. It was a, by Dagger called the Bayou 2. Mm -hmm. I hated the seat so much. The Igloo um, coolers had just came out with a cube. And I could get that, that perfectly squared little cooler. Mm -hmm inside the cockpit of oh, okay. my kayak yeah. so that became my seat so you have something to sit on okay yeah. that makes sense so yeah. i was able to sit up high um i was able to keep my back stretched out i wasn't tucked down into the kayak my legs weren't crunched up i was able to keep my knees bent and i just really enjoyed it a lot more um shortly after that the kayaks for fishing started to evolve and they created kind of the lawn chair style yes. seat for the kayaks. And that's really turned, I mean, that's really what's turned a lot of the sport on to such a larger population now. Because most people think of kayaks, um, they think of sit insides, they think of like whitewater kayaks and these little bitty seats and in these little bitty kayaks. And when you get out there and you find out you're in a 11 12 13 14 foot kayak you have this really nice comfortable chair yes. that has the option for a low and a high seat because yes. it's so stable you're able to keep your knees bent the whole time mm -hmm. you have really good solid lumbar support full adjustability with the seat it gives you a lot more options and when i first started kayak fishing a lot of times i go out my trips lasted 30 minutes to two hours now when I go out, my trap, my, a lot, most of my trips when I go out dedicated, I'm out on the water for eight to twelve hours a day mm -hmm. in a kayak or on my paddleboard. That's um, amazing. So comfort is really what allows me to do that and enjoy it. Yes. You know, I enjoyed it from the perspective of I'm just a water rat. You know, I have gills. I always tell people I have gills right behind my ears. <laughs> you know, I get really grumpy and cranky if I don't get those wet on a regular a fish, basis. Yeah. But being able to get out and, you know, I would trudge through these older seats and after two, three hours, I'd be uncomfortable for the next four hours. But right. I would just push through it because I wanted to be out there on the sure. water. But now it's not that case. You do have a very comfortable seat that allows people, um, you know, and me coming from, I've been in the retail side of paddle sports for the last six years. And I we have anglers that are in their 80s and, hmm. you know. Um, they're out there still kayaking and, and fishing and doing what they love and and it's great because they have so much wealth of knowledge and you get them out there on the water and just soak it in listen to them and stuff and you know you kind of bring back their youth at the same time by being able to get out there and utilize a kayak to do that well and i said this on the previous recording that we did here at this show is that the the or this event the the thing that is is amazing to me is the fact that there's constantly all kinds of innovations that are happening to the business that are happening to the industry that are happening to the products like yak attack here which you talked about yesterday they thought of like everything man and they 3d print prototypes and they come up with them they amount that the produce it and then you know they they sell at a reasonable price bona fide kayaks you know which you can talk about that for a minute but basically they made a kayak that's very stable i saw you fishing it yesterday and it was choppy water it was less than i conditions it was overcast i mean you, you know you had a couple of mishaps on the water but uh, you were grinding it out man you were showing it in real life you know this is it in action you know absolutely the the products um they've they've gotten crazy the last few years it's so much fun 
I've actually branded myself over the last year or so as the kayak doctor. I do. <laughs> I love um, it. That's great. I, you know, I you do... didn't tell us that earlier. <laughs> the kayak doctor. I'll start calling you that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Dr. I, Ryan. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Jones, Dr. the kayak Jones. doctor. Dr. Jones. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I do, uh, you know, I kind of got that from starting doing repairs and stuff on kayaks, but I do a lot of high-end customization. Mm-hmm. And the ability to add, you know, used to... You had a kayak, you spend a couple hundred dollars, you got a paddle, you got a life jacket, you go out there. Now as the sport's getting a lot more competitive, now you've got electronics. Any fish finder you can put on a boat, you can now put on a kayak. Um, Thanks to lithium batteries, we have small power sources that can power a lot of equipment all at once. Right. Um, You know, in the larger companies such as PowerPole, they've recognized this, and so they created the micro anchor Mm -hmm. multiple years ago. Would Archer, you use this trip? Yeah, I I had to. I mean, I mean, without some kind of pole or something, when I was out there, um, that would have made it a lot harder because as soon as you find a hole, you know, we found a really hot spot yesterday in that hole, and without the products and the accessories like that, um, you know, a lot of times I use a uh, Yak Attack makes a stakeout pole, which I've used for years before uh, Power Pole came out with anything. What, what is their pole called? The Power Pole's pole? Uh, the pole. Power Pole is called the Micro Anchor. The Micro Anchor. Okay, that's cool. So electronic. But no, the pole itself. The the pole. Uh, they just call it a stakeout. Pole. A stakeout pole. Okay, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I want to plug Power Pole because they're one of our sponsors of the magazine. Got to take care of them. So yeah, they have a <laughs> yeah they they call push poles stakeout poles. Okay, cool. Um, and they've really come in making sure they listen to the kayak anglers and creating. They just actually uh, improved their their pole this year for anglers at iCast. And so um, they keep getting better, making our lives a lot easier and getting out there. Because, you know, when it comes to that type of stuff, like yesterday, we had current pushing me. I had the wind definitely pushing Mm -hmm. me. Um, you find a hole, and as soon as you get settled in there and go to fish, you're out of that hole. Right. So having products like that to be able to get you in there, electronics to find, you know, sometimes those holes are there. Or now that you know it's there, you can mark it on your yep. GPS yep. and come back to and fish. So even uh, fish finders are awesome. I've gone through multiple bodies of water. I grew up as a kid fishing. And I used to fish these little community tournaments. And I was always curious why the the areas I fished were ideal for fishing for certain species. Right. And um, throwing a kayak real quick on that with my fish finder, I could see a ledge or I could see structure or something like that. And I'm like, okay, I knew there was always good fishing there, but I don't know why. Now that I'm older, I care yeah. about that stuff. Yeah. And now I can actually go out there. And so that improves the quality of your fishing time out on the water being a lot more produ- productive productive yeah Instead covering of, more water yeah too. you're covering more water you're fishing more grounds and uh, you're not fishing blind right so you know and you have all these companies bonafide um and yak attack um both of those companies are owned by the same individual extremely innovative um mm-hmm. in the field and uh, he is constantly creating new products, and then he takes a kayak, and he makes the kayak very easy to equip with all the accessories. Yes. So you may have an angler that just wants to go out and paddle, take his kid out, and play around in a body of water he's known forever. But then his buddy's like, hey, let's go on this trip. Well, now you can go. you got fish finder, power pulls. You've got paddle holders, rod holders. I mean, a lot of us... I started out fishing with one to two fishing rods. Now, on average, if I'm bass fishing, I take six to eight rods. Good on a kayak. On a kayak. Wow, I didn't yeah. even think that was possible. I was thinking you were, you know, three max, two in your rocket launchers in the bag. If that's even the right word to call it in kayak yep. world. Yeah, that's one of the names. Okay, cool. Rocket launcher, <laughs> and then maybe one, 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 you know, on on your rod holder in the, in the actual kayak. Where do you put six rods, man? Um, they've got rod holders. I I use a product called the Black Pack by a yak attack uh-huh. um it's a little bit larger than milk crate and they make it where you can put individual rod holders and they already have the holes pre-drilled and you can i think the the case has room for like nine rod holders that's if you fascinating want. so nine rod holders yeah 
And we use them when you're out there fishing tournaments and yeah, stuff. Yeah, it counts. You know, yeah. um, I spend my time the night before now rigging all my rods for what I'm expecting, the conditions, whether it's fall or spring. Sure, just like you're like rigging a, a big bass boat or anything yeah. else. Yeah. Um, because otherwise in the kayak, when I had one or two rods, if I had a bad fishing day and I couldn't figure out what they are biting, um, you look down by my foot in the base of the kayak and there's 12, 15 different baits there. <laughs> and when you add the amount of time you spend rigging that while you're on the water that's time you could have been fishing right um you know and it just it keeps getting crazier and crazier with that stuff and the companies are accommodating it you know they're coming out with these products to allow you to do it and to do it with ease and with comfort and they're very innovative with anchor trolleys to be able to drop and position your kayak exactly to the shore structure Mm -hmm. whatever you want um, against the wind the power poles um, coolers, uh, cooler companies are, are out there. They're making fish bags for kayaks now. That's what I was going to ask you next. And I wanted to get an inflatable, uh, paddle boards too, but I wanted to ask you how you keep fish when you're fishing a tournament, when it counts the most, how do you keep them alive or how do you keep them, you know, for your freshwater tournaments right. and bass fishing, I mean. we use a completely different system than your traditional bass tournaments. We use a measuring system. Okay. Okay. Cool. So we are. So it's catch and release. In other it's words, it's right? catch okay. and yeah. We call it CPR catch photo release. Okay. Cool. Um, that is the standard in, in this the is kayak fishing me, tournament. I had world. no idea. Yeah. Yeah. So we. What's really nice with those, like I said, anytime you think of like kayakers, paddleboarders, fishing. Um, we're very environmentally friendly. Sure. Um, we're very green, pick up trash around you, care about that stuff. We don't leave a mark where we've been at. And that goes along with our fishing populations as well. Yep. To be able to grab a, a fish, put it on a board, take a picture. There's some great apps that a lot of these tournaments use. Tourney X is one of the main ones nationally that is used. And you go on, you open up this app, you take a picture, it registers, and then you're able to go through and immediately release that fish within less than a minute or so. Mm-hmm. And it's back, it's in the same location it came from, and it has a lot higher chance of being able to thrive and right. live. Right. So your salt water um, is different. They use fish bags. Now I come from uh, Florida and we have the Extreme Kayak Fishing Tournament Series there. Um, I started by fishing a selfish tournament there, and that's a numbers game. Mm-hmm. Um, you catch it, you get up side of the boat, help boat comes in, verifies the catch, then you immediately release it. So they're very safe, very protected. Wow. Um, and then you have your meat tournaments during the summertime, and that's when things kind of get pretty crazy. Well, I was going to ask you how that works. Yeah. I mean, we have, um, we have some companies out there that are making fish bags that are shaped to be able to put up on the bow or the stern of the kayak on the front of the back to kind of balance it out. But you're pulling in 30, 40 pound kingfish. Uh, there's over a 70 pound wahoo caught last year at the tournament. On a kayak? On a kayak. Gee, what um, you've got tuna, um, grouper, all kinds of stuff out there, and we're bringing it all in. They're, you know, they fit it inside the kayak, on top of the kayak. So then you have to have efficient, stable kayak to be able to get all of that weight in, fight the surf, the, yeah. the wind, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very challenging. <laughs> Um, that sounds amazing though. Oh, it's, it, it's, it's epic. <laughs> yeah, you know, sure. it really, it brings, uh, it brings people from around the world to have a different perspective than going out on a 40, 60 foot sport fisher, mm-hmm. you know, and going out and catching it and you have all the room in the world. You really have to think a lot of things through, like we change the type of gabs we use, um, different things like that, nets. No, uh, we've adapted a lot of the accessories in the fishing world to accommodate kayaks. Uh, Yak Attack, with speaking of fishing nets, they make this leverage landing net that actually, since you're in a kayak, you may have a rod in this one hand. You can't stand up, get down on your knees, and get yourself positioned. So they actually have an extension that goes underneath your forearm oh. as a brace so you can get that leverage, get it up, and get it into the boat. That's a good idea. I went and fished a bass boat tournament in Missouri uh, a little over a month ago at Lake of the Ozarks, and I decided to take it with me. And I'm like, man, the bass boat guides could actually utilize this. Sure. If they're out there, they don't have a you know a, a partner with them, right. and they're out there by themselves. I mean, something product like that, like we're so innovative in our sport to make 
things easier and better yes. for the consumer that uh, you know it's almost getting s uh, better products than even like you know the general boat population has wow and i was just kind of thinking if you're going deer hunting with a crossbow you gotta you gotta you know get your crossbow and then do you just haul the deer on top of your kayak when you're done like you'd strap it to a hood in michigan or absolutely something? that, <laughs> makes, that, that makes great pictures <laughs> absolutely. everybody you know you're all you know paddling by and everybody's like what the heck is that guy <laughs> doing man he just harvested a deer and it's you know heads in the water and it's just laying over the top of his kayak i don't know i just the this now this is really I wrote an article back in March of 2017 called Kayaks for Kids and it was all about getting kids starting in kayaking and having not myself owned my own kayak I did a lot of research for the article I interviewed a lot of people I got some pictures from Hobie and, and some other folks and and uh, used it and basically it is an exercise of minimalism in a way right the essentials but also making the essentials work for your particular thing and that's what Yakka Tech does so well. But the other thing is that it is an exercise in in compact, but also like with the Bonafide kayak, you have a dry storage box, you know, in the middle. It, it, you could even do a, a electronics on, and put a battery in, or you know, whatever, and do your do your trans transducer and everything like that. I, I just the innovations just amaze me. I mean, that's the thing that's blown me away. They they keep growing. I mean, as fishermen are getting out there, the sports getting more competitive. Um, more consumers are out there that have the product you have these people coming up and with the you know with the use of uh, the web and and social media people are voicing their opinions on there right. and some of these companies are so in tune with their customers and their dealers um, they listen to them and they make these innovations and they make these changes so your your fishing kayaks now um, you know bonafide is a great example of that it is being designed by anglers, right. not not kayakers that are making a, a kayak that could be used for fishing like but they used to be. But fishermen that are using a kayak for fishing. Absolutely. So I they're see. thinking yeah. everything they're thinking through. That way, You're right. thinking, I have to take all this gear. Um, I need somewhere to be able to put a cooler right. with my food while I'm out there. I need somewhere safe for my electronics. I need somewhere safe to keep my phone. While I'm on the road traveling, I need somewhere for my rod storage right. and stuff. So yeah, you have, right. you know, you have these companies are able, you can open the hatch from the opposite direction and put an entire rod and reel set inside there so it's safe and secure. When you're driving down the road, what your normal person walking by is not going to have a clue. There may be a couple thousand dollars worth of right. gear inside exactly. your kayak. Exactly. So they, they allow you to make those changes, you know, when I first started, when they first started making kayaks for fishing, they were making a recreational kayak and like, oh, you can put a rod holder on here. Now it is a fishing kayak. But now they're built from scratch yeah, by the angler, fishing. for the right. angler, right. with um, some amazing people that have been in the industry for a very long time to accommodate being able to get uh, like the Bonafide has uh, the catamaran style hole on it. Yep. So you have something that is super, super stable, but is also very efficient in paddling and covering distance. So you're not wearing yourself out the whole time while you're out there. And then it has all the creature comforts, places to put your paddle. Right. You know, even the rubber slip on the front that you can lay your rod on and keep your tips from sliding off yep. or something like that. But then once you have a fish on, you can grab your paddle blade and throw it in there real quick so it's hands free. So little things like that over the years have really what's allowed a lot of people to be more comfortable in using kayaks and going out and fishing. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about before we end the show is is you're really big and you actually demonstrated this in person, which I was really you know honored that you take the time in this awful weather that we had this week <laughs> to take a, a, a one of the things we talked about at the iCast podcast that Chester and I did together was inflatable paddle boards and uh, inflatable sups. I guess is another way. Is it is it called sups in the fishing world? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times you, Stand especially if you're in people that are familiar with the with the right, term, with that term. You know, right. it's like if you're in the medical field, you don't go around saying you know CPDs and all these kind right, of terms. Right, right. All the but once you're in the in people that are in the know, yeah, you just instead of saying stand up paddleboard all the time, it's, it's a sup for short. Okay, so cool. yeah. for sure. Um, the inflatables have come a long way just in the last three or four years. The uh, amount of uh, pressure they can hold, you can literally, those the paddle boards we went out with this weekend, we could put them across a pickup bed and I'd stand up on top of it and it's not going to flex or bend or anything like that. 
when you see just amazing. I got on one, to, you know, not not in the water, but I got on one, and I'm like, this thing is as solid as a rock. It they does are. not feel infl- inflatable. And when I initially thought about, it, I thought about the raft I had when I was 12 years old. <laughs> that was just this piece of crap Chinese, you know. Uh, it rolled know, with the waves. Rolled with the waves and everything. It had no direction, no no. Uh, what are you tracking, as you like to say, uh, and that kind of stuff to it. And, and there's just no gliding through the water. It was just it was just awkward. And it was cheap plastic. And it was you got a hole in it, a hook in there. And it, these things are built like a Sherman tank, man. They are. They're very efficient. Um, one of the biggest things in the paddleboard industry that has allowed them to really change is a down stitching technique. Um, so they actually have a fabric inside from the top to the bottom now that are threads by the thousands just running up and down. Um, to make it even more sturdy. During it, it makes it more sturdy. What it really does is allow you to hold significantly more pressure right. in the same material. You know, used to you put too much pressure in a board, it would bubble up. Now, because of the down stitching on there, um, this allows you to put, you know, the paddle boards that were holding 10 psi a um, few years ago are now holding 15 to 18 psi. Yes. And these are rigid. You can put larger anglers on them. You can put multiple people on an inflatable paddleboard. Mm-hmm. Um, you can put your gear. Um, and then Boat's done a great job with the, the Rackham inflatable that I use this week. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got a rail all the way down the side. Yep. Um, I had the redfish I caught. He tried jumping off while I was trying to take a picture of him. He hit that rail multiple times <laughs> and never went over. That's good. So I got to use that. Um, they've got multiple tie downs to be able to put coolers on there, so you can use a seat. Most people think when you're on a paddleboard that you know you're really limited. You stand up, right. but you actually have a lot of versatility. You can stand up. You can sit down. You can kneel. You can lay down. During the summertime when it's really hot, I love to lazy fish on my paddleboard. I will literally sit down, put my legs into the water, sit on the side of the paddleboard, yep, and, and just sit there and fish, and it's just really comfortable. That is really cool, and, and it kind of the outdoor lifestyle thing that I talk about on the show all the time is just kind of chilling out. And with yeah, you're just out there hanging out. You know, I'm not being competitive or anything, so you're just out there having just a good chill. time and, yeah. and enjoying it, making a great experience for yourself. And the, the board companies, just like the kayaks, are being very accommodating to the angler. Yeah. Um, they have really cool aesthetics now. That brand new camo on that Rackham is sexy. Absolutely. It is. It's like a digital, digitized kind of camo. It's yeah. kind of got that really cool, yeah. And really then cool. you've got uh, rod holder mounts on there. You've got multiple options. I had the power pole micro anchor on it. Uh-huh. That, that, that mount comes stock on there. Oh, wow. Um, so I literally, all back, I had yeah. to do is get a couple of stainless steel quarter 20 screws. And now I have an electronic anchoring system out there. Huh. And so they're easy to, to paddle. And the nice thing is, is a lot of people don't have a place to store these. Right. Um, especially when you're in a lot of uh, more heavily populated areas. When I was in Florida, you know, people, everybody has issues with condos and stuff like that. They have nowhere to store these. They don't have trailers to put this stuff on. Or garages to put like the trailers that. in or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so being able to have an inflatable, this thing literally fits into a large backpack. <laughs> um, so you can walk around with it. Um, for uh, adventurers crazy. like me, you throw in your trunk, the back seat of your pickup truck, you have it with you all, all the time. The time yeah. You know, I, I drive by so many new bodies of water, I'm like, I wonder if there's any fish in there. Mm-hmm. I wonder, mm-hmm. that'd be great. And now so you have this or... inflatable paddleboard, you already have it with you. Right. You inflate it with an electric pump real fast off your cigarette lighter in the truck, and you go and you jump on the water and you get <laughs> you go paddle for 30 <laughs> I minutes. I love it. That's great. You know, so it, I it, love it just really allows you to be outdoors more and have more opportunities to really get out there and, and enjoy you know god's creation and everything that that we have out there to to explore with ease you know they're they're affordable products they're lightweight products they're not super heavy they're not super bulky you know last time i went to an outdoor retailer we uh picked up a couple of inflatable paddle boards um, from one of the manufacturers drove up to the green river with our fly rods and we were paddling down class three rapids fly fishing off inflatable paddle boards then we're driving back to the airport and we find a mountain range and that has little bitty streams in it and we yeah. go up there go do some um, 
brook trout fishing and then we check in our paddleboard at the airport as a normal check-in bag and go home mm-hmm. you can't do that with a full-size no, kayak or a paddleboard or anything 10 footer like that. or 12 footer is not going to fit in your backpack you know? yeah so <laughs> you know but just just it just and i'm really thinking about investing in one of those the uh, inflatable because i don't have a lot of room in my house there are places to store kayaks and that kind of stuff and it's just one of those things where i'm like you know that, and and also like like boat B O T E the the company that that makes you know some of the better inflatable cap. I mean they're all good, but I mean you know the that they're the ones that y'all featured here. They also have the Rover, which is the big you know um, engine power like we talked about at the beginning of the show. The um, the the outboard powered. Um, uh, paddleboard yep. and the cool thing I saw a video I think it was Palm Beach Pete or one of these guys he was basically um, on YouTube there were two guys on the paddleboard just to do a test drive of it mm-hmm. there are two guys on the paddleboard holding on to the little the little you know stand up thing and uh, you know one was driving and one was riding on the front of it and I was just like you gotta be kidding me I mean it was just like wow I probably wasn't the safest thing to do but that's how they were but it's just crazy. I mean, it's, yeah. just, it's amazing. And there's a nice wood grain floor. There's a nice, you know, there's there's rails. There's, I mean, it's just everything you could ever want out of a flat board. Yeah, you know, aesthetically appealing. Oh, very aesthetic. Just over 100 pounds, has yeah. a 500-pound capacity. Um, Palm Beach Pete's actually a really good friend of mine. Oh, we good. I didn't know. I, I forgot to ask you about Palm Beach Pete because I follow him on YouTube. So I just he, I just ran into him looking at kayaks one day. Now I've got you as a wealth of knowledge on kayaks I can ask. But yeah, he's Palm a, Beach Pete was my guy there for a while. Yeah, he's. So. I, I love Pete. He's a great guy, and he loves growing the sport. And he has. We have fun playing and testing out new product cool. again yeah, and I've stuff seen like that. that. Videos, so, yeah. But yeah, the Rover's a, a, a very interesting. Um, machine and, and and craft that's come out you know it got a lot of attention whenever it first came out it won best to show at ICAST, at ICAST. For 2017. I, saw yep, I saw that when it came and out. Was being able to take a little craft and put a six horsepower outboard and get up on plane yeah for sure on and plane, then yeah. you put one or two people out on there i take my dog i put the cooler on there yeah. and just buzz around and you don't it is heavy it's bulky but if you're dedicated and want to go do that stuff and you don't have room for a trailer or a lot of places right. don't allow trailers in the right. places we like to go, you could car top that thing, mm-hmm. put the motor in the back seat, throw your accessories in the back, and take it wherever you want. So it, it keeps going with the kayak and paddleboards just being more effective in getting people out there on the water and being efficient and allowing more people to cover more ground right. and, and handle different aspects of the, of the sport. So being able to have the rod holders and the stakeout poles, that thing has mounts for two power pole micro anchors. Oh, it. two. Wow. Two of them. So, I mean, imagine going out on the water with your bass boat, and this guy's in this little one-person <laughs> vessel with a six-horsepower outboard up on plane right. with two power poles. <laughs> two power poles in the air. You know, <laughs> that, you know the, the separation of, of kayaks yeah. and boats keeps getting closer yeah, and closer That's great. in some aspects, especially now, you know. Used to, they started by making all these crafts just for kayakers that like to fish. You know, I was I was one of that that target audience, but now they're becoming so innovative with those uh, all this product and new crafts and everything like that. They're they're targeting these boat guys. Yeah, you know. So how just, about something you don't need a whole team to launch? You know, how about something you can just throw in your pickup and throw on top of your roof rack and go? You know, and how much more time efficient is it too? Oh, for sure. You know, you're not spending two hours prepping, right. two hours afterwards cleaning, and all this kind yeah. of stuff. It just it makes it a lot more user friendly. And you look at this stuff and you're like, I got two hours to fish tonight. Yeah, that's you're it. Not, you're not gonna go out and be like, okay, we'll we'll get the boat out, we'll, we'll set it up, it and all that stuff. Know. You're fishing for what, 15 minutes? Right, right. You know, yeah. you throw a inflatable paddleboard, the rover, a kayak, or something in the water. You're out there, and you know you're on the water in 15 minutes, and you're out there fishing for an hour and a half. <laughs> you know, and you it's talk a lot about, more efficient. A lot more. And efficient. you talk about like kids and stuff, um, because these fishing kayaks have such larger capacities. 
it allows a lot of families to take their sons and their daughters yeah. and even I know multiple of my customers in the past that have their wives that sit in the back cockpit uh-huh. of the of the kayak they put a little stadium seat or yeah, sure. a little chair or something some padding back time. there yeah. and then they're able to take their kids or the family out on a single paddle craft instead of owning multiple and and just go out there and just enjoy stuff and right. spend some time together and be out on the water and get away from social media and gaming and all that kind of right. stuff and get out on just the water. Just enjoy the outdoors. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm all about on this show is lifestyle. You know, it's lifestyle. It's about making things accessible, affordable, and all that other stuff for sure. So, uh, thank you so much for... Oh, one last question. Do you ever caught a carp in a kayak? I did an article on that this year. Carp in a kayak. Absolutely. Carp. I've caught a uh, drum on there. I really love game fish, and I consider uh, carp a game fish. I've always grown up in Oklahoma. My whole family was all about catfish, right. and we'd spend all night long out on the lake fishing for catfish, and I was praying that a carp would come by and pick up my bait. <laughs> I would rather catch a carp than a catfish right. because I've always enjoyed the fight. Yeah, and that's my point. When I wrote about carp and a kayak, I always say they play the game to win. And uh, they fight you like they owe you mo- like you owe them money. I mean, that's the best way I look at it. It's kind of like the Cape Buffalo in Africa. He looks at you like he owes you, uh, like you owe him money. It comes from an outdoor writer a long time ago in a book, and that's just kind of where I borrow that from. But I will argue, and I've said this before on the show, I will argue that a striper is not the hardest fighting freshwater fish. Uh, you get a big carp, and he's mad and he's playing the game to win, I think he'll pull the rod out of your hands compared to a striper. I fought striper, okay? I'm not saying that they're not a fish to be reckoned with, but I think a carp's even harder fighting. What do you think? Car- I, I would agree with that. Um, I know some guys that target carp specifically, yep, setting state too. records and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, man, the fights, you know. One thing, one of the coolest experiences when you're in a kayak is catching a fish large enough to pull you around. We call it we call it a sleigh ride. A <laughs> sleigh ride, I love it. <laughs> That's great. So getting a large carp on there, you know, they're a pulling you ride. all over the place. You know? <laughs> they're they're a lot of fun. Dictated by the fish. I love it. That's a great analogy. <laughs> That's perfect. That's funny. But yeah, they're as a as a game fighting fish. You know, a lot of people think they're trash fish and. And I bow fish for them off my paddle sure, and stuff. Yeah. But being able to hook up with one of those, I I never get upset if I hook up with a carp. No, they fight. Um, you know, I'm always. You know, I think I have some epic battle with a bass until it gets up, and then I'm like, that explains it. That's yeah. just a normal carp. That's that's a hard hitting fish, though. That was my point there. So you've been on with me for a while. I don't want to take any more of your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me, man. Well, I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. I love enjoying the sport. I love finding other people that uh, really like getting out there and getting other people in the community and in the public to uh, to go out and try these new things and get out there, get out of their houses and get on the water and sure. enjoy what life's really, truly about. So how can people find you or do you want people to find you or do you have our audience to connect with you or what do you think? I'll put your info in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, you can find me on Facebook and you can also find me on Instagram as the Kayak Doctor. Oh gosh, um, you, you have branded yourself as that. You're not joking. That's great. The Kayak Doctor. So, uh, Is that yeah. Kayak DR or Kayak Doctor? Uh, the full, full the spelt full out, the Kayak Doctor. I'm going to follow there. you. That's great. So I have, uh, you know, I've done <laughs> customizations with kayaks and stuff on there, but uh, I I'm I'm on on there constantly posting fishing trips and stuff like that. The redfish we caught last night, yeah, you know I got that posted up on there. You know, make everybody back in Oklahoma and all these cold places. I just came from very jealous. They're stuck in their houses or out there fishing for a little 10, 11 inch bass, and right. we're down here just slaying the redfish. Slaying red fish. the redfish. And we didn't slay them all that good or this week, but I mean, we did pretty good yesterday afternoon at least. So. You find that one good hole. Yeah, that one hole, and you just you stay on it, man. You power pull down, and you stay on it. And the thing is, it was one of those things where I wasn't even popping the cork. I was just letting it, I was just watching that bobber, watching that, that float on the, the popping cork, the cork. And when that thing would go down, I was just like, it's on, baby. I mean, it was. But They were people, so finicky. They're yeah, like they counting to five yeah. every it's single like you, time. It's like throwing finesse shrimp out there and stuff. So anyway, but no, it was great. Um, I just really appreciate it. And, and thank you for, you know, on behalf of, of a Texas Fishing Game Magazine for hosting us this week in this event. And uh, I know you're with Frontier Marketing and Sales and Marketing and, uh, you know, you guys do a lot of the retail side, but we really appreciate you guys. So. Not a problem. Appreciate you uh, coming down here and spending some time. All right. Thanks again. 
And there he goes, Mr. Ryan Jones. You can find him. I'll put a couple of ways you can connect with him on social media, especially Facebook. Um, he's just got a lot of great content out there. Really cool guy. Next up is Dave Brown from Okuma. He is one of their senior marketing guys and uh, really had a good time to sit down with him for a little while and uh, chew the fat and uh, just talk about fishing and some of the Okuma product line that they have here. And here we go. Joining me on the podcast, Mr. Dave Brown. Hi there, how you doing? Better than I deserve is my usual answer to that. So, exactly. Uh, that's, a, that's a statement of grace. But yeah, I um, wanted to have you on to kind of talk really briefly about, you know, or as long as you want to talk about Akuma. You represent Akuma, you work for them, um, and you have a lot of um, a lot of experience with, uh, with all types of fishing. And then obviously Akuma makes spinning, uh, bait casting, um, as well as, you know, big game rods and reels and, and all that kind of stuff. That's correct. Yeah, I've been with Akuma for 12 years. We're based in Southern California. So at home, we do a lot of saltwater fishing, West Coast saltwater fishing anyway. Right. So we do a lot of tuna and yellowtail out there on the West Coast. So some big hard fighting fish. In fact, if you're out there right now, you have a legitimate shot at a 200-pound bluefin anytime you go out, even on the short trips. Wow. Um, but as far as uh, Okuma, I'm, uh, like I said, I've been there for 12 years. I'm one of the marketing managers and... Uh, I uh, travel the country, do a lot of fishing, see a lot of different fishing styles and freshwater, saltwater, pretty much everywhere. What's your favorite place to fish? You know, I love Venice, Louisiana. Venice is awesome. <laughs> it um, doesn't get much better as far as the action it's a, here. <laughs> it's a dream dream place to go. This week it was a uh, was a little tough. Yeah, it was a little bit of a Debbie Downer with the but weather. But actually, I'm sitting here as we're talking. I'm staring out the window and actually seeing some blue sky and sunshine. That's uh, the first time this week. It's been chilly. It's been chilly. It's been overcast. It's been wet. It's been cold. Yeah, I that's mean, for sure. Yeah, it's just been crazy. But, you know... I've said this often about, you know, the outdoor lifestyle is I brought like, I, I know there had some foul weather gear here from Grundens, but I brought all of my foul weather gear from home. And this is one of those trips, Dave, where I used every stitch of my foul weather gear on the water. That's I for mean, sure. Every bit of it, because it was ridiculously cold and wet. And one of the days, the first, the first day, Tuesday, we went out, saw that the weather was, you know, it's like, you know, I, you know, white caps all over the place, turned around and came back. And I was like, whew, that was good. But the next day we went out, you know, yesterday we went out and did, did a lot better. But I, I needed every stitch of that. You know, it, it's just about having the right gear, you know, for your needs because you never know what kind of fishing it's going to be. Having the right gear at the right time. In yeah. fact, uh, foul weather gear for us in Southern California is whether I wear the tank top or the <laughs> T-shirt. <laughs> So uh, luckily I brought some t-shirts. But yeah, all that Grunin's gear came in gear. That Those new boots are awesome. Yeah, those new boots from Grunin's. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. And yeah, um, so basically give us a rundown of the models that are that are new or that, that you want to feature, that kind of stuff. You gave us a rundown together as media the other night, and i just like to kind of you know cover the bases real quick to educate people about what you've got. Yeah, certainly. Down in Venice here, you got so many varieties of fishing. Uh, you can go out to the rigs, you can go out chase tuna, do a lot of this inshore redfish stuff. So what right. we did this whole time was a, a lot of red fishing, uh, you know, a lot of spinning gear, some bait cast stuff. What I brought along was our Shadow Stalker series of rods. Those are a nice inshore series, spinning yep. and bait cast. Um, you know, nice parabolic feel to it. We did a lot of pop and cork, and those those were set up nicely. And you know, at a hundred dollar rod, they're they're awesome for what we were doing. And I paired those up with our Azores reel, which is an all aluminum reel inshore, corrosion resistant. Everything's bathed in Corrosion X, which uh, makes it awesome for that brackish water and even the offshore water. Um, you know, those are great for what we were doing. We got a couple bulls mixed in, but most of that fish were that that fun size stuff. The uh, fun size, fun size fish. <laughs> That's kind of like the fun size candy bars exactly. that we were eating. Yeah, exactly. They were the fun size. <laughs> the fun size. Well, eater size, I yeah, guess, is the best. Eater one size, yeah, eater exactly. Eater size for sure. So. And that other stuff we were doing, you know, we didn't have a lot of trout around, but I brought some of our new Ricky Red rods, which uh, those were fantastic little rods for what we were doing out here. Those are sponsored by. That's our, those. Uh, so Ricky Ricky Red is from. Y'all, uh, spon- y'all sponsor him. Exactly. Yeah, Rick Murphy. He's down in uh, Florida. Sure. He's got the Texas Insider Fishing Report as well. Um, but he designed those rods from top to bottom, 14 models, bait cast and spinning. And, uh, you know, it's made for this market. They're hot. They're Gulf Series rods. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. They're so, awesome. And they're red. So they're they're pretty, red. They stand you know, out. Is... You can see every little tip movement if you get a little bite on there. Uh, you know, we match those up with our Epixer XT spinning reels, which is a graphite reel, nice and light. We did a yeah. little 30 size. And I think they had them spooled up with 30-pound braid, and they were awesome. 
Yeah, it's it's just fantastic. The um the 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 action, it's smooth. I mean, I always joke around my hunting my hunting gear is in perfect shape. My fishing gear looks like it has just been sure. beat to hell. Yeah. But um, you know, it's one of those things where your treasure's where your heart is. If you get a good rod and reel, you know, it should last you for a long time because and it should be you know uh, work for you. And you guys make a lot of different reels and, and rods that are for different styles of fishing. Whether you're going offshore for big game or whether you're you're in short for the redfish and stuff but the balance of your rods and reels you know the lightweight aluminum um the the smoothness and everything like that of the of the reel is just it was just incredible i was very impressed we do we pride ourselves on gearing you know we came from a, a cnc background way back 25 years ago when they oh, cool. started coming into the into the united states here it's yeah. actually a taiwanese company and we do a lot of gearing for a lot of different companies, which a lot of people don't know. But, uh, you know, all of our big machined aluminum reels, like our Makaira offshore reels, they've been the pride of the West Coast. If you jump on any big sport boat right now, you're going to find a full range of Makairas whacking giant fish. It's it's pretty pretty fun time to be there. <laughs> and those are massive reels, man. Those are the big, um, uh, what, what do you call the, the, the like, bay cast style? Big conventional. Conventional. Yeah. Conventional yeah. reels, yeah. And for, for, you know, you're a big, big game, that's what you really want to use if you're going off of a sport it. fishing yacht or anything like that. Yeah, we know? use uh, something called a helical cut gearing, which is a real even mesh, so you don't have to have any kind of clicking when you retrieve. Yeah, so you're not hiding yeah, yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. silent retrieve on those things. Oh, yeah, I noticed that. But yeah. we make them all the way from a little 10 size, which is nice and compact, about your fist size, all the way up to a 130, which the guys up in Prince Edward Island are catching those 1,000-pound bluefin off of. <laughs> it's uh yeah it's crazy it's crazy <laughs> so you know uh, if you watch wicked tuna or deadliest catch or any of that stuff i mean the, the the main thing that i take away from those shows is you have to have gear that works under the you know severe conditions but at the same time gear that performs well no matter if it's a hard hitter or a, or a you know or a midget you know that's so. exactly it like on the west coast we have that long range market which you'll see those guys that are doing those 16 day trips and they're down deep deep in mexico 16 days 16 days yeah and they're they're chasing giant yellowfin tuna and these sport boats they're using okuma gear now as most of their rental gear and at the end of the season they're just bringing us back milk crates of reels and just saying hey check these out go through them so we'll go through and we'll clean up the drag you know give them nice fresh drags for the season right there's boat rash all over these things and they've been scratched up because they're rental gear but inside it's just like opening up right out of the box clean oh, cool real smooth because it's because it's sealed and it's, it's all sealed it's... and tight and these these boats are switching over and they're they're digging them the one thing that I, I make a big deal about in the outdoors is is buying something once for durability and not having to buy it three years later or two years later or whatever. A good rod and reel should last you, you know, the course of a long time, you know. For sure, yeah. And, of course, that's how you maintain it and take care of it. Sure, if you're out, sure. If you're taking a graphite reel and you're out saltwater fishing for big red fish, you know, just take that thing off and rinse it off. You don't have to open it up. You don't have to repack it with grease. You don't have to do anything else to it. But just give it a nice light rinse. Don't hit it with uh, WD-40, which is going to, you know, eat all the grease out of that thing. Yeah, but, that's the bad thing. Yeah, yeah, just keep it clean. You know, a little. you don't even have to use soapy water, but a lot of guys like to dip it real quick or just fresh water, rinse it off. That's yeah. it. Yeah, just yeah. fresh water. Keep it clean, and that thing should uh, last you quite a while. No, that's good to know. And, I mean, I always try to say, you know, to to buy the best gear you can afford when it comes to some of this stuff. But you guys have some great price points across the board, and you have, you know, reels that match your rods and rods that match your reels. Um but the spinning reels, I was really impressed with, you know, not just how smooth they are and everything like that, but just the, the, the fit and finish of them overall, which is something I talk about when I ride a lot, is is the um, the way that, you know, the way that the gearing ratio and everything like that is, is just fantastic. It's, uh, you know, it's we got to pack a lot of technology into those little reels. Like, if you're looking at our Inspira, the uh, ISX reels that we had out here the other day, they uh, feature a few different key te technological points there and you got like the torsion control armor which is uh it's a little forked piece that goes all the way around the body so what that does is that prevents any kind of torsion within the reel so you're not going to get any twisting um, well, all of those good. are yeah, it's pretty awesome they're all injected with our c40x process which is a long strain graphite fiber so it's 50 percent stronger and 25 percent lighter than our regular graphite process and then on a rotor we use our uh, uh, cyclonic flow rotor what that does is if you look at that design, it's a real sleek design on the rotor, but as you turn the reel, it actually sucks the water out of the spool. So if you're fishing, like we were this whole week fishing in the rain, you know, everything gets wet and damp, and every time you spin that reel, you're actually sucking the moisture out of there. Water come whipping. That's it's, brilliant. Man. It's really awesome. That makes it makes really a lot of is. sense for like harsh foul weather conditions. Yeah, you know, for sure. To suck that water out of there and keep things dry and clean. In those coastal markets, you know, out here we're doing a lot of kayaking, paddleboarding as well, and we do it on the west coast. So you're 
you know, if you're paddling, you're four or five inches off of the water, and that reel's getting moist all day. But every time you spin that, you're, you're sucking the moisture out. It's great. Golly, that's great. So uh, anything else you'd like to add? I'm going to let you, uh, you know, you go from there. I yeah, mean, we're excited to be down here. I mean, this is just, a, you know, the whole Gulf market. We've been up and down and around. Florida's a key market for us. Louisiana, are, Texas. Right, you're moving more into, what did you call it, the Telo State? The, the, the Telo State. Telo right? State. Texas, State. Arkansas, Taylor. Louisiana, Oklahoma. <laughs> All right, folks, I've never heard Telo being called before, but that that's a four-state, you know, right. region, I guess. Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. That y'all are moving back into with the, with the, with the, with the passions. So. That's it, yeah. We, uh, we love it down here. We do a lot of the bass tournaments all through eastern Texas and Louisiana. Uh, but, uh, you know, getting down here along the coast, like we said, Venice is our passion. This is tough fishing. We do a lot of our product testing down here with a lot of the boats, and it's fun. I'm excited to be here. That's great. And uh, so you're off the coast of California. Correct. You, okay, good deal. That's where you live. And what kind of fish do you all mainly go after there? Uh, you know, we've got everything. So if you're if you're on the freshwater side, you're usually chasing largemouth bass. And right. On the West Coast, we're known for throwing giant swim baits, huddle stins, the big sure. depths, slide swimmers. You know, we're throwing up to one pound baits with for these big largemouth bass and you got a legitimate shot at a 10 pounder every time you head out Golly, we've got wow. some striped base uh striped bass lakes as well where you're going to go throw some of those big top water baits and then you get into the salt water you have everything from inshore bass fishing which is our spotted bay bass calico bass you run out to the islands you can do yellowtail bluefin yellowfin tuna it's uh it's a pretty wow. magical place Oh, that's great. So I just like to see how the rest of the world fishes, you know, some yeah. of the times. So yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of diversity we have in Texas and obviously here in Louisiana. And, you know, it's just one of those things that I like to explore and at least lighten and educate people with what else sure. is out there. But, I mean, I can't say it enough. Having good gear is important and having gear that's going to, like, for instance, when I'm catching, these weren't rat reds, but these were these were smaller, you know, eater size redfish. But, those things play the game to win when it comes to, to fighting do. you. And it was taking the drag out. The drag wasn't too loose. It wasn't too – I mean, it was a smooth transition. I was able to land those fish really easily, and I thought your gear was great. Yeah, once so. you get dialed in, you're you're set there. No, that's good. That's really good. Well, anything else to add, sir? I, nothing I could think of. I mean, if you guys are interested in some Okuma, you know, come check out the website. Yes, We're I was going to uh, get your contact. Yeah, for sure. www.okumafishingusa.com. And that's got uh, all the products, rods, reels, clothing, bags. we got all kinds of fun stuff over there. It's fun to say the word Okuma, too. You know, <laughs> it's just, uh, sorry. But uh, any way to connect with you on social, you on any of the platforms at all? Uh, I am. You can actually go to daviesworld.com. That's my personal website. I got oh, cool. my blog. I got videos. I got, uh, you know, the YouTube page. Of course, you know, for Okuma as well, head out to uh, Okuma Fishing. Uh, you'll see all of our links on there as well on our website. And that's got the Instagram, the Twitter. We got it all. We're all out there. Daviesworld.com. Daviesworld.com. Should I have called you Davy when we sit down here? No. <laughs> Depends where you're at in the world. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so it, it, it's kind of like Dustin'sProjects.com, which is my website. Sure, it's kind of sure. the hub of all that you do in exactly. the outdoors, including what you do for the, you know, for the company. So anyway, that's great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dave Brown. Awesome, awesome, awesome guest on the podcast. Love having all these guys. And really, the weather was such, um, you know, I, I don't want to say foul, but it was definitely not pretty outside uh, at this event. You know, we really had time to sit around the round table and do these podcasts. And that's what I love about this show is it's kind of free form. It's kind of loose and, and wild and, and, and you know, flies close to the ground and, and does so many things to uh to just basically educate you and just help you be a better outdoorsman and outdoors woman that's it's really what i'm about in these podcasts is really educating you and just helping you see some of the things that i see and benefit from some of the things that i benefit from as an outdoor writer and videographer and speaker blogger podcaster and all those other things that i do in the industry um you know personally and professionally with texas fishing game i i really just want you to see things that i see and use things that i use and things that have helped make me successful in the outdoor field that's why they call me the outdoor success guy, I guess. Um, but you know, it's just just about helping you be a better outdoorsman with some of the products and services that these companies offer, and that's what I really try to do on this show. So I hope you guys, um, you know, take notice of that, and uh, we'll use these things to help you be a better angler. Uh, and it doesn't really matter, especially with fishing. I wanted to definitely say this before the show was out. Um, you know, hunting is getting to be ridiculously expensive in a lot of places, especially here in Texas. And the one thing about fishing is that, you know, it's a lot more accessible. It's a lot easier. And I know some of you guys listening to this show don't hunt and you only fish just because it's cost prohibitive to do both. Or um, like my dad said back when I was a young child, uh, he would always say, well, 
you know, he took up bass fishing hardcore on the circuits and stuff like that that he used to run the McDonald's circuits, the Home Depot circuits, all the different circuits, tournament circuits that were going on back in the day in the local area of uh, southeast or south uh, south central Texas. He, um, you know, he said I could fish all year. You know, and Texas is wild, mild enough, cal- uh, uh, mild enough climate that um, you know I could fish all year. I could only hunt four months of the year. You know. And of course, you can go invest in a boat and spend a lot of money on that and electronics and and all the different graphs and uh, upgrades and everything that you can make to your boating gear and that kind of stuff. But really, fishing's simple. And, uh, you know, fishing's affordable. It's accessible to most people. It's uh, available to most people anywhere in the world, really, anywhere in the nation, uh, our nation for sure, the United States. Uh, Because you can find a lake nearby a lot of times, unless you're in the middle of the desert. but even there, I mean, uh, you, you've got some opportunities to, uh, to go fishing in, in re- rivers and creeks and ponds and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that's what I'm all about with this podcast. And I, you guys know this if you listen to the show for any length of time. I'm about making the outdoors accessible and making you successful in the outdoors and trying to go forth with the best knowledge and the best tools, the best tackle, the best equipment. And the nice thing about what we have now, I don't know, I've said this on the show a bunch, uh, we, it's all good. You know, it's all good. It's not, there's a lot of, a lot of crap has been weeded out over the years, if you'll excuse my language. Um, you know, a lot of the garbage is just gone. And so what's left are companies that are competing for your dollar. They're competing for your business. And they're going to come up with a higher quality product. They're going to come up with a better, you know, uh, uh, more efficient and effective way for you to get out on the water at a lower price because of competition. And that's a beautiful thing about what goes on in the outdoor industry, even though it's fierce and there's a lot of different people that are trying to be playing this space. Um, you know, it really is something that, uh, that that I take notice of that I think is interesting because we're in the golden age of fishing. We're in the golden age of angling. We're in the golden age of boat, boating, uh, personal boating, like we talked about on this show. I mean, incredible. The one thing that uh, Ryan and I did not talk about is round boats. There's two companies that come to mind for that. One of them has been a sponsor at fishgame.com. That's Roundabout Watercraft. They make these circular boats that you can just roll onto the water, and um, you know they're very, very stable. And the other ones run in our magazine before a couple of times. Ultra Skiff, they're based right here in Texas, and I think that uh, Roundabout's based in Florida. And uh, both just, uh, I think they're both fierce competitors with each other, but I mean, both have fantastic personal watercraft options uh, that are round, that aren't your traditional kayak, and aren't your traditional sup board or paddle board, or whatever the case may be. Uh, they are specifically designed to um, basically, you know, do do what you need to do in the outdoors to get out there and get on the water, and they glide pretty well across the water. You may think, how does a circular boat do very well aerodynamically on the water? You'd be impressed. I've seen one of these in action up, up close and in person. So, anyway, just wanted to mention those two companies as other personal watercraft options before I end this show. And thank you guys so much. If you've not done so already, I know some of you guys is your first time listening to the podcast. And if you can get past this crazy guy on a microphone that talks a million miles an hour, um, I love you guys all. I really do. The show is for you. So if you've not done so already, please subscribe to the podcast. You get a new show every two weeks. I've already got an editorial calendar planned out for the year for the most part. I've got a little bit of deviation probably off of that that Chester put together. But um, I'm really uh, really just, just excited about the year, man. This is a new year. This is all kinds of new new content coming your way and uh, new guests on the show too is my plan and um also i just wanted to bring to your attention our newsletter which comes out three times a week tactical practical tuesday wildlife wednesday and the thursday texas state of the outdoor nation newsletter uh all three of those are free they come every single week we, we took one little break around christmas christmas week uh, that's why we didn't have a new podcast for that week. And then, um, and then, you know, we're back at it with the new year. So new content, fresh stuff, and those newsletters, they all, most of the stories all go end up at fishgame.com, which is our website and blog. Uh, you can go check that out. You can sign up for the newsletter at fishgame.com. You can also search for all of my articles, all of Chester's articles, all of the articles that are written by any of the outdoor writers that are on fishgame.com. Um, just under the uh, under the blog section, and also just by the search bar, it's on the right hand side, or scroll all the way down to the bottom if you're on mobile, um, or right hand side if you're on desktop. And um, really, just great stuff. I mean, just good content. I- I've written a lot of stuff. I'm writing a lot of stuff now as I'm recording this. 
uh, new products that I've reviewed on my YouTube channel to kind of bring you some uh, and with links so you can go buy the stuff if you want to. Um, just just some new ideas and, and products and stuff that I've been testing out and playing with and, uh, and having a lot of fun with hunting and fishing and uh, camping and, and survival tools and tactical stuff and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So anyway, stay tuned to fishgame.com for that. Check out the newsletters for some of my stories and uh, Chester puts together a great newsletter every three times a week. And um, really, really appreciate you guys watching, reading, and listening. Have an awesome day in the outdoors. We'll see you next time.